combat battle reports. Today we're doing a miniature reenactment of the First Battle of Bull Run, also known as the Battle of Manassas. This is the first major engagement of the war, taking place on July 21st, 1861. The southern states had rebelled over the last couple of months of 1860 and the first few months of 1861, resulting in the new Confederate military of the South firing on Fort Sumter, beginning the war. This prompted President Abraham Lincoln to call on 75,000 volunteers to crush the rebellion. Nearly half of these new recruits, under the leadership of General Irvin McDowell, formed the Army of Northeastern Virginia and marched on the railroad hub in Manassas. It would be their first objective on their campaign toward the Confederate capital. McDowell was skeptical of a movement this early, saying his men were all green. Lincoln told them that the enemy was green too. You are all green alike. McDowell's plan, from the town of Centerville, was in three parts, utilizing two feints. The first was south, directly at Manassas, to keep the Confederate army occupied. The second involved a division who would travel west along the Warrenton Pike, to appear as though it was crossing a stone bridge to get on the Confederate flank. The third would be two divisions which swung far around to the north and came back down, ostensibly on the enemy's flank as it rushed to defend Bull Run Creek. All the Confederates had to defend at the beginning were two brigades, one guarding the stone bridge under Nathan Evans, and another a little south under George Coke. Evans, who would be getting the brunt of the attack, had only 1,100 men under his command. He began by holding off the Union Brigade under Robert C. Schenck, who was having difficulty getting across the bridge despite larger numbers. The rest of the 1st Division began arriving and crossing over a nearby ford, but Evans had a more pressing matter. In the first use of semaphore in a battle, he was warned by a signal officer to the southwest of a second flanking maneuver further north, along Matthews Hill. Evans pulled back from the creek and maneuvered to meet the oncoming division. He was soon joined by two other Confederate brigades under Brigadier General Bernard B. and Colonel Francis Barlow. The combined force managed to delay the turning maneuver and slowed down the Federal advance long enough for more Confederate reinforcements to get into the area. However, these Confederate brigades were struck in the flank by the brigade under Colonel William Tecumseh Sherman, who had gotten across Bull Run at an unguarded ford. Nearly surrounded, the Confederates pulled back to the oncoming reinforcements. Northern civilians who had come out from Washington to watch the battle cheered for the success of their soldiers as they ate from their picnic baskets. While the Confederate brigades regrouped on Henry Hill to the south along with their artillery under Captain John M. Bowden, the Federal divisions met up in a long line on Matthews Hill, and their artillery, under Captains Ricketts and Griffin, bombarded the enemy from Dogan Ridge. Though the Federals had the advantage, they did not press it, choosing instead to soften up the enemy lines with artillery while much of the infantry collected souvenirs. The fire was devastating for the Southerners on Henry House Hill. The superior Federal artillery ripped apart bodies and broke up their lines. Some men began running. One of their casualties of the deadly fire was Judith Carter Henry, an 85-year-old widow who was stranded inside her home, unable to leave because she was crippled. A Federal shell burst inside the house and killed her. It was about noon now. The Confederate commanders, Generals Joseph Johnston and P.G.T. Beauregard, had arrived on the field to find it in chaos and near ruin. Also arriving on the field was Brigadier General Thomas Jackson with his Brigade of Virginians and Jeb Stuart with his cavalry. Jackson arranged his men on the far side of the hill where they would be protected from the Federal artillery and placed his own artillery such that when it fired, the recoil sent it down the hill so it would be out of sight of the counter-battery fire. Seeing this, General B exclaimed, There is Jackson standing like a stone wall! The name stuck and became Jackson's nickname. It was believed for many years that this was a rallying cry to keep B's men from retreating, but recent studies have suggested that he was saying this in frustration, that B and his men were willing to face the enemy head on while Jackson and his men were hiding behind the hill. It was not the standard practices of war at that time. B was unable to explain himself later as he was shot dead soon after, along with many of the men who were standing on the hill with him. The Federal infantry at last moved forward at approximately 3 p.m. The artillery also tried to maneuver forward to get a flank shot. They were supported by the 11th New York, a unit made up of firemen from New York City and who dressed in flashy Zouave uniforms. While still positioning themselves, they were set upon by Jeb Stuart's cavalry and many of the men were chopped down. The artillery, meanwhile, was assaulted by Confederate soldiers still dressed in blue uniforms. The gunners did not fire as they thought the enemy soldiers were some of their own men until it was too late. 
The Southern soldiers turned the guns on the flank of the Union ranks marching up Henry House Hill. The Federals countercharged and took back the guns, and they continued to switch hands back and forth in a contest for the Union right flank. The Union center, meanwhile, marched up the hill toward the rebels. The front Confederate line folded, and Jackson ordered his men to hold their fire until the enemy was close. And when they came to within 50 yards, they opened up on them with everything. Jackson then ordered them to give the bayonet. He also ordered them to yell like furies, and thus the rebel yell was born. The Confederates screamed as they crashed into the Federal lines, causing a panic among the Yankees. Jackson's men were joined by two more brigades who had just arrived by train, a first in warfare, and the combined Confederate army overwhelmed the inexperienced Federal army. They were so baffled, they did not even always know who their enemies were and who their friends were. Stuart was able to capture a large body of men by simply claiming to be their commander, and he ordered them to lower their weapons and march into Confederate custody. The Federal retreat was further exacerbated when a wagon crashed on a bridge along the path of the retreat. The panic spread among the men, afraid they would not be able to get out. The ensuing rout stumbled upon the civilians still watching the battle, and they were all caught up in the mass exodus together. It was later referred to as the Great Skedaddle. The Federal Army would not recover for months. Both sides had thought it would be a single battle to decide the fate of the nation, but the North was not ready to give up yet. More volunteers were called upon, the army was rebuilt, and the war raged on for another four years. This has been another miniature reenactment by Command Combat Battle Reports. Thank you all for